Hello and welcome to the SANS APAC webcast series, Leveraging OSINT for best, Better DEFER Investigations. My name is Ruby Sousa and I will be moderating the webcast today. Your presenters are Jeff Lomas and Micah Hoffman. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point by using the questions tab and the brief Q&A portion will take place at the end of the webcast. Thank you for your attention. Now let me turn the mic over to one of your presenters, Micah Hoffman. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having us and for sharing your lunch or your dinner or whatever it is, wherever you are in the world with us. Uh, Jeff and I have some exciting, fun, interesting digital forensics and open source intelligence information uh, to share with you over the next hour. And we look forward to making this interactive. So like Ruby said, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we're happy to answer them at the end of the broadcast. Next slide, please. So one of the things that Jeff and I talked about when we decided that we wanted to make a, uh, a webcast for SANS and for APAC is how can we bring in some other kind of non-traditional audiences into the OSINT realm. And one of the things that Jeff uh, said to me is that he is, has been doing digital forensics for many years and his experience there using OSINT would make a really great launching pad for a talk. So uh, we came together and one of the things that we're going to present now is how to use digital forensics and OSINT together to enhance really forensics investigations. Next slide. Now, the first thing you're going to probably want to know is who the heck are we? Um, I am on the right side of this slide. I'm the author of SANS's only open source intelligence class, SEC 487. I also do open source intelligence and cybersecurity consulting for my company, Spotlight InfoSec. You can find me online on, at, on Twitter at WebReacher and my website, webreacher.com. Now, I'm going to turn this over. Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Micah. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Lomas, and I'm currently a detective for a, a large uh, metropolitan police department, and I'm here in Las Vegas, Nevada. So for me, it's uh, early on in, in the evening compared to Micah, but I know everyone's at a different time zone. Uh, I've done, I, I don't want to overestimate how many uh, digital forensic exams and how many things I've helped out with, but it's literally in the hundreds. Um, and it's because that uh, we have a uh, quick turnaround time and we're a very intelligence-based uh, digital forensic lab. Uh, I can be reached on uh, Twitter at uh, Blue Bloodhound. That's blue, French blue, Bloodhound. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Micah. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, actually, if you could, uh, why don't you go to the next slide and tell us a little bit about what open source intelligence is. We always like to define these things before we, we go ahead and, and get into it. So, Jeff, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about open source intelligence here. Right. So, um, I'm not going to read this entire slide to you guys, but the, the basics of uh, open source intelligence is uh, the words that I've highlighted in yellow. So uh, the main part you should get here is that any sources that are publicly available are collected, exploited, disseminated in a timely manner. So we have a vast amount of information that's out on the internet. We also have a vast, vast amount of information that's uh, in different uh, digital forensic uh, incident response now. So taking all that data, and putting all together so it makes sense to someone else and someone else can use it for intelligence purposes or furthering an investigation or what, whatever it is, the, the industry that you're in, those uh, investigators can, can do what they do in a timely manner and that the information is valuable when it gets to them. Now, OSINT, uh, so, you know, full disclosure, I have a, you know, bachelor's in uh, intelligence management, which is really just a mishmash of you got, you know, GeoInt, which is, you know, it's kind of self-explanatory, but it's, you know, geography, intelligence. You have OSINT, which is all part of that. Uh, MassInt is measure, uh, measures uh, intelligence. A SIGINT is a big one. I will be kind of talking about that in our, uh, in our talk here is uh, signals intelligence. So you have uh, human, we won't do any human today, but uh, human intelligence. So you have all these areas that are overlapping with, with each other. And it's not just in our pod, in our, in our webcast that we're going to talk about. It's, it's everywhere. So um, we're, we're going to dive into a little bit of GeoInt, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of MassInt, some SIGINT. And then you'll, you'll see kind of where we're going with this. But um, the value of everything, though, 
lies in the compilation of everything put together and what you do with that information and present it to the people who need to see it. So here's our current way, at least the way I do it in, in digital forensics. And this is, I've been to conferences and this is how most people do it. So first thing we do is, is we acquire the data. So what, what's acquire the data? So the, in my situation, I'll, I'll get a cell phone or something along those lines and somebody will go, hey, I, you know, I've done a search warrant on this and I need you to you know, extract the data and I want you to do some analysis on it. Okay, so I ask them, well, what are you looking for? Do you have some timelines? Uh, do you wanna know where the person was? Do you wanna know if the device was on? Well, just tell me what you need. So I'll, I'll get a couple blurbs from them. I'll go through and I'll do my process and uh, analysis and, and I'll try to produce the best possible deliverables. But as you can see here, we get these arrows and they only go one way. Um, and there's an end to this. So that's where we're, we're gonna hand over to Micah. Yeah, so with digital forensics, you have that one way path because that end goal is, hey, I need to go to court. I need to give this to a judge. I need to find out where that criminal is or whatever. But one of the things that we find within open source intelligence in general is that it really is cyclical. We, uh, we constantly are doing some of the same types of things, the requirements gathering. I'm finding out the same type, asking the same types of questions to my customers that Jeff's asking to his, you know, what do you want me to do? Uh, what's my scope? How much time do I have to collect this? What, what kind of techniques can I use? What can't I use? And then within this open source intelligence cycle, we go ahead and start doing some of those same things. We retrieve the data. Now, retrieving the data within OSINT, that's going to vary depending upon what your goal is, where the target is, and what your data is, whether you're looking for IP addresses or trying to get some attribution on some hacker group somewhere in the world, that retrieving the data could put you into social media, it could put you into places where you're looking up DNS information. Once we get that data back, it's that's open source data. We need to transform it into open source uh, information by figuring out is the data relevant, is it relatable, is is it related to what we're looking for, is this my target, uh, does, does this matter? And then what we do when we're analyzing that information, that's where we do what Jeff was just talking about, is, is taking that, that data and information and transforming it into intelligence. The intelligence is going to tell us what does this mean to my customer, why should they care about this, whether it's I found the perpetrator of that crime, or I know what, what that who owns that IP address that just hacked your website. Whatever it is, that's the important part. But within the OSINT cycle, you can see that we, we sometimes uh, don't have as much data as we want. And what we'll do is when we're analyzing the information, we might look at a certain person, whether it's a, a maybe it's a person that's your target or a business or whatever, and say, you know what? There's all this interesting stuff that we got over here in this area that we need to explore further. Now, I come from a classic cybersecurity background, and for those of you that are penetration testers or defer people or even or cyber defenders, you'll recognize the term pivot. That means you take one piece of information. Um, let's say that I, I find information about a person, like I got their hacker name, or I got an email address. That's probably a better one. Um, they, I got an email address for a person that I'm looking into. Well, what I need to do is I need to now start searching on that email address. I also need to pivot and take off the first part of that email address and maybe search for that first part as like a username. And that pivoting, sends me back through the OSINT cycle. So I have to gather my requirements or at least examine my requirements and go, are these still relatable? Are, is these, are these things that I still, uh, still pertain or do I need to talk to my customer again to increase my scope? Then I get the data, then I get information, and then I go back to pivoting and reporting. And eventually we get to the point, like Jeff said, where we have to create that finished product. Jeff? And, to, and to interject, Micah, so in yeah. this cycle here, this is actually really where the uh, the differ uh, community is going right now, especially in the area of mobile forensics, because uh, information, it's it's real time for you know, the, the coin was turned by Brian Carrier. But the term real time forensics refers to the fact that, you know, this data is ever evolving. You got data in the cloud. You got data on mobile phones that's constantly changing. And these investigators need this information. We get the information to them. They get more information back that we can pivot on. So this model, 
is actually a more of a model that the digital forensics, in my opinion, will, will be going to in the future. So there, there's some challenges uh, using <laughs> for different people uh, getting into OSINT. Uh, you know, first, uh, it's lack of training. You know, it, there's not really a whole lot of training classes out there. We'll talk about some at the end, but they're they're not really super easily accessible. Uh, you know, we all get trained up, especially in law enforcement. You know, you get trained up in all these classes. You go to all these vendor specific classes, but nobody really teaches you the the, the basics of pulling volatile data, right? So. As digital forensic examiners and, and cyber people, we all know how to deal with volatile data. OSINT data is just a little bit different and we have to do things just slightly different. Um, most forensic examiners, uh, like in my, in my case, uh, they're just lacking the, the overall resources. So that's when we're gonna get to that part, but that's where we really need to, to start uh, uh, getting better. So there's there's hope, right? So like I, like I talked before, uh, Digital forensic professionals, we uh, and, and cyber people like Micah, we know how to deal with volatile data. We deal with it all the time. Uh, in the case of of uh, OSINT, it, you just have to be a little more diverse. So there's uh, training out there. There's education, Micah, uh, his class. Uh, there's lots of other ones that, that are available. But there, there's ways to go here to keep doing what you're doing in digital forensics or cyber and get better at OSINT at the same time. So. What really led us here? So it's an example. Uh, this I started doing this uh, this technique about three years ago, and at the time I just had these numbers, right? I had uh, they gave me some numbers and I found in a phone uh, phone from a database, and it was like a. Now I'll, I'll throw out some of these, these nomenclatures so that everyone's on the same page. That you know there's an M MNC which is, ends up being a mobile network code, uh, a MCC which is a mobile country code. A uh, lack and a SID. A lack is a location area code, and a CID SID is a cell ID. So all those numbers actually pertain to a physical cell tower. The problem is, in in this specific case, you don't have the exact location of the cell tower that this, uh, in this case, a mobile phone hit off of. So the first thing I did was actually I went to someone in our department that dealt with this volatile data. I gave them these numbers, and they said, Yeah, I don't. I didn't get anything back. So me being stubborn, I said, well, that's not good enough for me. So I went to use my Google Foo and I went out there and it turns out that there are lots of different places that you can find this data, that you can use these this data and you can turn it into real intelligence and you can present something really nice to, uh, in my case, I'm presenting it to investigators and to uh, uh, into, uh, pro prosecutors. So Jeff, the example that you're going to go into right now is is one from your your past. You know, the names have been changed to to protect the innocent and all, but but it's something that could the the techniques that you're going to talk about and the the digital forensics and especially the OSINT techniques, um, as we're going to show later on, these can be applied around the world because of the technologies, because of the websites, because of the openness of the data. So um, Jeff's going to talk here about some stuff uh, in in his part of the world, but you know stick with us because we've got this. Uh, we're going to be talking about stuff over in Asia as well. Right, and that's exactly right, Micah. And so, in these cases, like like the Micah was saying, this data is it's it's essentially a plant by me. This is not this is not real data. Uh, we're doing this to protect the innocent. I can't use past uh, cases, uh, you know, just based on my line of work. Um, but it's important to give you kind of a feel for how a flow in this can go. And this could be anything. It could be you know, I've used this on several different types of cases, homicides. Um, in, in this particular case that I made up is a carjacking. So the basic case that I had here uh, that we're just gonna go over is this, we're gonna pretend that a, a man assaults a woman with a gun in an area. Uh, he runs from the, uh, he, he runs, well, he flees from the from the, uh, the victim. Uh, the police later on, many hours later, catch up to him. Uh, they chase after him. Uh, they can't find him. Then they end up finding him later and they find his phone in a different place. And uh, so the, the, the phone at the time uh, was locked and uh, they couldn't get into it. And the investigators on their side, they didn't contact us. And so they didn't get the cell phone uh, towers that the phone was connecting to. So a year later, these, these cell tower records aren't available. So the only data available that we have is, is, is uh, data on the phone. So uh, once we get into the phone, uh, 
then we have issues where you know the let's say the suspect saying he didn't do it or or whatever the case is. So in this case is uh, we're finding we're trying to find the truth here. So the first thing I would do in this situation, just like we talked about in the beginning, is is the uh, I need to gather my requirements. The customer, which is other detectives, they want to know, hey, where was this device at during these times? Can you tell us, you know, based on what you have, where this device was? Uh, the deadline is tomorrow, right? They decide, hey, guess what? This thing's going uh, to it, there's a evidence deadline or whatever there is, and then they need it right away. Okay, so now we know we're up uh, up against the clock. And then the other thing is that they, they need to be able to uh, easily understand this report. So I can't just throw out a bunch of numbers and GPS points and tell them to go Google it or tell them to do anything because they want the easy button, right? They, they have a whole bunch of other stuff going on. They got, you know, paperwork to file and all these other things. And the last thing they need is to get into more technical things and not be able to uh, access the information quickly. And that's where I come in. <clears throat> so... Yeah, regardless, I, I just made up a bunch of these addresses and numbers. So this is things that like when I when I'm gonna OSINT and I'm gonna go out there and I need to have numbers in front of me and I go, okay, I have these this, this time that these things happen. We know that uh, we have phone records saying that a victim called this time and we have uh, these addresses where these witnesses saw these things. Okay, so those things we can say that we know. Okay, good. So the, the database that we're talking about, and this is you know not a new thing, it's the Haravad.db. That's present in, uh, it's present in most uh, GSM uh, Android cell phones. Most flavors of Android have this in it. Uh, all it does is it's it's responsible for storing cell tower data. So like like I was saying before, it's got the MNCC, the MNC, the LAC, and the SID, and it's also got uh, some other stuff like uh, it's got. Uh, times that are associated with and a whole bunch of other cells that we're not even going to use. But um, those are the basic things that that uh, come in the Haravad DB. So this is kind of uh, what I first did, and we're going to get into other ways to do this, was I had to export this to a CSV just so I can look at it, right? And I can say, okay, wow, we got these MCCs, these MNCs, what do I, well, what do I got going on here? So the description here, um, this is just a screenshot of it, but there's a whole bunch of other areas in, that that the device actually logs uh, for the purpose of not for tracking the user, but for the purpose of of showing which uh, um, app was using a uh, using the, a cell tower at a certain time. So you see that you know we have the main one you're going to see is Maps and Navigation, but you know there's other ones like Gmail and YouTube. And so this is a Google specific database that, that that's uh, generated by the, the Google products. So Jeff, before we get into the open cell tower stuff. Just so that our audience understands, what we're really talking about is you have a, let's say that you have a phone of a suspect and you are doing some forensic examination, examination on it and you're extracting the information from the uh, Neharavad database that gives you those posi the, the cell towers that they have uh, that have been noticed on that phone. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct, Micah. So we haven't gotten to the OSINT part which it looks like we're getting there. Man, we are so close. We're so close. So, all right, go ahead. So in, in all my Googling, I, uh, the first site I found was Open Cell ID. So that's what I want to do. I want to take this MNC, MCC, MNC, and I want to see where these cell towers are at. And that's going to give me a better idea of where the device could have possibly been located. And again, let, I'm going to preface this with saying that this technique is not for precision location. These towers are estimated uh, in their strength by the, all these different sites, and we're going to get to a couple different ones. And they're, it's, it's not an exact location where these cell towers are at. So uh, as you'll see later on, there, there's going to be a little bit of variance in there, uh, but the more uh, data that you can pull, the better. So the first one I found was Open Cell ID, and you know my personal opinion, I think Open Cell ID is one of the best, uh, not because it was my first, but because uh, it's it's got a backend uh, free open API. Um, it's got uh, the ability to uh, you know to automate the process, and it's also kind of got even if you're not going to automate it, you know just going into their API and 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 manipulating the numbers, it's it's got an easy uh, interface. So. Open cell ID, it's not just for Las Vegas, okay? This is where our, our, our examples are coming from. As you can see, uh, it's pretty popular all over the world, especially in Asia. 
uh, especially right there where all the population area is in Australia. So uh, you have a lot of different data points that are on there. And as, as you're going to see later on, uh, it's uh, open cell ID is not the only one that, that covers all these, uh, these different areas. Micah, did you want to talk about Cell Mapper? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, so one of the things that, that we can do with this data, and this is the OSINT's part, that I love looking at all the different sources where companies and governments are just publishing their data out there into the wilds and, and for us to look at. And, and here what we have is, um, this is cellmapper.net, and the URL is on the right-hand side. That big one you can type in, or you can use the short URL, sec487.info, which is a, a URL shortener that I've created, um, slash Q6, and that'll take you to that cell mapper net URL. But the neat thing about this is that you know, Jeff just told you that you have to extract the MCC, MNC, LAC, and the CID from these cell phones, and 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 that's where you can get the data. But what I was doing when when I was researching this with him is, you can just zoom to an area like over here. We are in uh, the marina area of Singapore, and you can just click on one of these red dots. Each one of these represents a cell tower of some sort. And then on the left-hand side, we have the MCC, which is at arrow one. We have the MNC, which is at arrow two. The LAC in this case is called the region, which is the 711. And then further down on the page, it presents you with each of the different transmitters or cell IDs that are on that tower. And so, we don't, I mean, if you wanted to use this type of technique to localize information or to see what's around an area, you could do this manually just by using cellmapper.net or other sites that are like it. Excellent. Okay, so let's get to the meat of it. So this is the uh, Open Cell ID API. This is, uh, for, so to get to Open Cell ID, it's all free. Uh, you do have to sign up for an account. That's free as well. Uh, the the uh, Open Cell a API, uh, typically in the request part, and I'm going to go right up here in this area, uh, the way it works is I always click on one cell. And the reason I do that is because uh, this tool is not meant to be used by us. And Mike and I were talking about this the other day is that, you know, we use so many tools that they were not meant to be used this way. And and, and the Open Cell ID is, is not in cahoots with uh, law enforcement or any OSINT people. They're just putting out there, this out there for anybody to use. And so the way we use it for our purposes is that we go one cell, because that's all I'm looking for. And I put my information and so it'll look a little bit different than this but if you just go to where the number one is here you put your mcc and your mnc and then right here it'll also ask you for your your lack and your sid and then you press submit and it just gives you your latin your long so what i was doing was i would take this information for each entry and, and for for the example we have there's really only eight data points that really come down to it and it provides a really accurate picture for us but some of these uh, depending on how much time or, or uh, how much data that the da database has collected, uh, it, could, it could build up pretty quickly. And that's why we're talking about automating it later on. But for eight data points, I wasn't super motivated to, to, to go around and, and, and try to automate this. So I would take these this Latin, this long here, and there's already, uh, so it's the tool I was using was uh, it would, would be Celebrite. So uh, Celebrite or any other uh, forensic, mobile forensic tool can, can export to a CSV or an Excel document. And I would plug in the Latin long, and I would do that for each one. Okay, so now I have all my data and I have uh, my all my cell information and I have my Latin long and I have my times in there. So they have an, a reference of, of when the this device uh, connected to these cell towers. So next I needed to make this thing visual. So I needed to make this kind of thing kind of flashy so that a, a, a detective or a, a prosecutor, especially prosecutors, because they're very busy, um, if they see something that's boring or it's out of place, they'll just move on to the next one. But I wanted to make sure that this stood out and they understood that this is very important data that could help their case. So as you can see down here uh, in EarthPoint, they actually give you an entire uh education on how to make KMLs and how to make KMLs look really good. This is how I how I learned to make KMLs in my office when people when I ask, hey, how'd you do that KML? 
I just send them to the site and say, look, there's so much information here. You're just going to have to go through yourself. I'll, I'll help you out. But, you know, they, they give you everything you need. So you got your latitude, your longitude, your name, description, icon. They tell you what each icon does. And the great thing about EarthPoint, it's free. And they do have they they do have uh, uh, limits to how much data that you can submit at any one time. But like I was saying before, uh, I'm only doing eight data points at a time in this case. So I mean, I can really do it all I want. Uh, on top of that, I, I did some more reading into EarthPoint, and they do say that they purge each uh, submission to uh, into their tool. So you take an Excel document and you just submit it into their tool on the website, and it and then it kicks back to you a KML file. You take now, that KML file. Yeah, go ahead, Micah. No, 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 go ahead. Take that KML. Yeah, then you take that KML file and you open it with Google Earth. So the great thing about Google Earth and in most Google products is that IT people, and I'm not an IT per person per se, but they are usually okay with users, the average user uh, getting permission to install uh, tools like Google Earth. Uh, they, they trust Google, it's a well-known product, and it, there's no, not a whole lot of overhead. So uh, naturally, uh, using a KML file works great because it's small, and then the, and anybody that has access to Google Earth can open it right up. So one of the things I wanted to point out on that last slide, Jeff, was that um, even though you have, you know, the, the site, uh, can you go back a slide? Um, yeah, even though the website has um, said, you know, I've got pretty good OPSEC. We delete all our data. We just ran into something that was with the Face app where they said, hey, you know, upload a picture of your face and 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 we'll delete the data. We'll delete your picture after 48 hours so it doesn't stay up there. And that sounds good, but we have no idea what they're doing. Are they extracting all the meaningful data from it? Do, does this site extract metadata from your Im your Excel file that you're pushing up there so that they know that the registered copy of Excel that Jeff used was for a certain police department. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is that we always have to be a little suspicious. We always have to wonder, what am I giving away by using some kind of third party website to accomplish my tasks? And I think later on you'll see we have a, a safer way to do some of the same type of stuff. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's it's a little bit OPSEC safer than than uploading uh, Excel to um, some random website. And, and I agree with you, Micah. Uh, you know, you, buyer beware in this case, uh, and it depends on your comfort level and, and what kind of cases you're working on. Uh, if you're more high profile, then you, you may you may want to stay away from a site like this. But if uh, you, your organization allows it, and this is how you do things, and you can do this too. Yep, agreed. So I put the data into Google Earth, and it looks really nice, actually. So, and the way I did it was just basically the way the site uh, uh, lined it out. So you have, this is the start point here. So you have the device that kind of mold around this area here around these dates and these times. And then you have this big, huge line here. So somehow, some way, it doesn't mean they took a straight line here, but this device ended up over here in this area. So there's actually, you can't see it from this, this zoomed out area, but there's a couple data points that are going to be up in this area. But this is the area of the incident that occurred. And that's important because this area right here is the, the supposed area that the uh, suspect was and, and the device itself was ended up being found. Okay, so we got from here all the way up here and all the way down here. And so... I just kind of felt like I needed to to make the data a little bit better. So what did I do? Well, I needed to find another data source. So I went to Cell ID Finder. Well, Cell ID Finder does things a little bit differently. So what I didn't mention before was to use the, the API, uh, what Mike is going to end up talking about, but you have to download the database. So Cell ID Finder works a little bit differently where there's no backend API. Uh, the site itself is just what you see here is what you get. You enter in your MCC, your MNC, your LAC, and your SID, and then it gives you back data. The cool thing about this site is that you have the option of getting two different data points from Google and Yandex. So it turns out that this site is able to basically query Google and Yandex for these particular sites and then tells you if there's uh, there's uh, latitude and longitude associated with them. So as you can see here in this, right here in the bottom, so this one says, well, the, the Google coordinates are 0, 0.0. Uh, 
Okay, well, that just means that there's no data available. Now, if there was data available here, you could actually press this little averaging button here. So what that'll do is that'll split the difference. So sometimes, let's say you had a, a point right here, and then you had a point like right next to it, right? But if you did the averaging button, this this will split the difference for you and give you one point in the middle. So that might be useful to you uh, to make you, uh, you know, to say, hey, well, I use both data points and there's a possibility that the cell tower is in between these areas. So that can be helpful in, in some ways. So I took this data, which is, you got the URL here at the top, and I put that into a spreadsheet just like I did the, 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 the previous website. And then I got this. So if you're looking at this, you're thinking, well, okay, that looks, well, besides the fact that I changed the colors up, this looks a lot like the other uh, one. Well, yeah, exactly, because um, it's pretty good data, and uh, I, I'm, I'm starting to feel pretty good about this. But then I did something. I go, okay, Google Earth is, is re it's a really nice tool, free tool. And uh, I, started, I decided to lay the data on top of each other, and then something happened. Uh-oh. So as we can all see, we, we can feel pretty good about these data points up here at the top where the incident occurred. And, and, and that, that's very important that these two things are together because it shows the device was there at the time uh, that the, uh, the incident occurred. But we have a little bit of discrepancy in here. And this is, we got an aerial view. This is, you know, probably miles. I can't tell from this particular view, but I was, you know, it's my curiosity just kind of kept getting to me. And I was like, well, you know, I know these cell towers put, you know, a lot of uh, signal out. And so these particular tools and these databases that they're pulling from measured these cell towers and thought they were in these areas. And so I knew that that I was going to get some pushback from, say, the uh, defense or, you know, wh whoever it was and say, well, how do we even know that your technique is it works? And, you know, all you did was kind of just figure all this out yourself. And so I said, you know what? I, there's one more thing I can do. So I went through the phone. I said, well, is there anything else that, are, that could be on this phone that could tell me where the phone was around this time? And in this case, there was. There was a Wi-Fi signal. And I had a date at the time last connected, which was a co coincided with the date that the uh, device was seized and the, and the suspect was arrested. So I went to Wiggle.net. Wiggle.net uh, is another free site, great site. Uh, if they store both Wi-Fi and cell data. I wouldn't recommend using them for cell data because their database isn't quite as big, but you can still use it and see what kind of results you get. Uh, you do need to create a user account. Um, and sometimes uh, the tool can be what I call a little bit wonky, a little unreliable. Uh, so you have to be patient with it. I mean, remember this is free. Uh, so when you go in, so when you go into Wiggle, it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the, you, you use the advanced query. So you sign up for your account, uh, you get advanced query. So in this case, I had a BSS ID. So I enter my BSS ID in to, to here, and then all I do is press query. And then the query gives me back, and we, we blurt out some data. Again, this is not real data. Uh, we're, we're also trying to protect the people that this data might belong to. Uh, this is an actual CenturyLink 4429. This is a router that, you know, CenturyLink, uh, which is a company over here in the United States that would give somebody to, uh, so they could, it's probably one of those all-in-one router slash, uh, you know, uh, modem. And so, but the important part here is that we got a latitude and a longitude. And one thing I want to point out about this, so <clears throat> irregardless of when this, <clears throat> when this case is happening, that, that there's, a, there's a time here, and this is the time that the, uh, so somebody that just happened to drive by and put this into Wiggle's database, this is the time that, that the, the router uh, was noticed by someone else driving by. So just, you know, you have a first scene, you have a most recent, so they're a day apart from each other. So just realize if it's two years later, you have to kind of take that into, into account. And I would include that with the data just to let them know. But it doesn't mean that the signal's not there, that the router's not there. It just means that, you know, it, maybe it's a little old. So Jeff started talking to me about all of this, oh, and I was hey, like... Hey, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Michael. Oh, can I break away to the Google Earth real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do the Google yeah. Earth thing, man. Yeah, so this is a big part, Micah. <laughs> so, I know, I so, know. We so needed a slide that said part. Jeff's so, gonna break so away. You, so, Go so now we're on a cliffhanger, right? We're like, hey, so where is the wiggle? Where is the router, right? Where is it? And so, okay, well, we're gonna get to Google Earth here. So I'm gonna end the show real quick here and we're gonna go over to uh, Google Earth. So, oh my gosh, I already showed you where it's at. Okay, so <laughs> you have uh, these points just like we had seen them before. 
I'm going to zoom in just a little bit, not too fast. So here's the two points we have. We have one way up here and way down here. Well, I'm going to turn the wiggle side on because I've already prepared all this. And boom, the wiggle one end up the Wi-Fi signal end up being right next to this other cell tower. And it, and it turns out that you know this device had actually connected to this Wi-Fi before, and it's a Wi-Fi they remembered. And and the person it doesn't know that they're connecting to it. They've connected to it before, and so they might have been trying to get away or get into this person's house or or do whatever. But now we have uh, a way to, to to associate the device not only with the cell tower data, but also with the Wi-Fi data. And so this adds more uh, confidence to, to the data when I'm presenting it to anyone, saying, look, I know these cell towers can be a little off sometimes, and so can Wi-Fi, but I have, uh, call it a coincidence, but these things are right next to each other. And so you combine that with all the other physical evidence, and these things start to pile up, and we start to get back to the truth. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Micah. Yeah, man. And, and while you're switching back to the PowerPoint, one of the questions that somebody asked was, how do you validate the data quality? And and the, J, Jeff just showed you, you don't rely on just one source. And that goes for all OSINT. Oath, as we've seen in recent years, there's a whole bunch of people that will say anything on the internet. Some of the data on the internet's just wrong, outdated, or, or um, computers have used object character recognition and have pulled in incorrect data by reading forms. That data can be wrong. So, so what we do is we validate with multiple sources. Jeff wasn't happy with one cell tower information, so he went to another one. Then he wasn't happy with where that was. He wanted to get even more specific information. So what he did was he looked for an additional source that has maybe more localized information that still would be on a phone. That was the Wi-Fi. And since that phone had connected to that Wi-Fi and to a cell tower, he was able to go ahead and extract all that data from his dump of the phone and then localize it to even a, a tighter circle of an area, which is great. I mean, that's what we do all the time. We seek the corroborating information. Now, my background, uh, I like doing things efficiently. When Jeff was like, yeah, so I did this with four or five points. I'm like, that's cool, man. Make your spreadsheet. That's awesome. And then he said, yeah, but what if we have like tens of points or like a hundred points? What are we going to do then? Um, and what we did was we did some Googling. And one of the things we found was that Matt Edmondson, who's a an amazing O-Center, amazing OSINTER, I'm a defer person, and uh, he's a great coder. He actually wrote up a blog post three years ago that was on the same thing. He wrote something that was a script called uh, Anaximander, and that goes ahead and does what we want it to do. It takes a dump from Celebrite, and then it takes that information and then grabs uh, and then looks up where each of the different cell towers that that device has heard, looks it up against the little database. Next slide. The problem with Anaximander is one, how do you say that word? Uh, and then <laughs> Matt, Matt created this project and uh, it took me about three days to be able to say Anaximander and I'm still not sure I'm saying it right. But Matt made this information public, and with his help, we've gone ahead and added an Anaximander underscore 72.py uh, script to his project. That's a script I just updated, and what it does is it takes a, a, a dump from Celebrite version 7.2, and with Python 3.7, which is one of the most written, written one of the most recent versions that's out there, and it will automate this process for you. Now, the thing that we have to understand is that what this is going to do is you, before you even get to the place where you um, are looking up what the cell tower locations is, you do have to do some requirements. One, you got to make sure you have the Celebrite dump. You have to make sure that you have Python 3.7, but you also have to go out to the Open Cell ID website and download their 900 megabyte database uh, that's a, essentially a CSV file, an Excel spreadsheet of where all of these cell towers in the world are. You put that on your computer, you uncompress it, and that turns into like a 3.2 gigabyte CSV. 
Then you run Matt's script there. At the very bottom of this image on the right hand side, it says DBFILL. And what that does is it converts that CSV into a database, a SQLite database. Now we can go ahead and use the Anaximander scripts against that database. Next slide, please. So with the database all set up, what we could do is, is we can do this not at speed. I mean, it, we can do this in bulk. Um, and so what Jeff and I did was we wrote up the process of how to do this, each of the different steps, all of the links for that we've talked about here today, they're already in a blog post that's been that was published yesterday on a website that, that I'm very passionate about called OSINT Curious. OSINT Curious or OSINTCurio.us is a website uh, with myself, uh, some other really cool OSINT people from around the world. We pitch in, we write blogs, we do videos to help you and everybody in the world learn OSINT for free. So there is a blog post out there that you can look at and it has all this data in it. But I think one of the things that you're probably interested in seeing is how does this thing work? So Jeff, if you can next slide it, we'll get, go through a little animated GIF here. And this is uh, running the Python, uh, the Anaximander 7.2 against an XML location small. That's an XML file that's been exported from a Celebrate uh, dump of a phone. And what we're seeing here is each of the different records that's that's uh, retrieved, and each one we see that MCC, the MNC, the LAC, and the SID. And what it does is it looks in the database and pulls out the latitude and longitude of that device. Now, I'm a very impatient person, and 351 uh, records is going to take a while. Now, this is this video is going to loop, so just we'll just let it go again. But it takes a while. So what I did is I built into the tool a Control C function, where if you press Control C, it will go ahead and create that Google Earth KML file that Jeff was talking about. It'll create it with whatever it's processed already, so you don't get like an incomplete file. Jeff, if you could switch the screen here, just uh, hit the next slide. Now, this is what that KML looks like. Now, the cool thing is, is about it, since we have the date timestamps for when these different cell towers were heard, you can see what I'm doing is I am moving that slide, that time slide, and as I move the slide forward and backwards, those cell towers, when they were seen, pop up and are viewable on the map. So at first, on January 20th, 2017, we only have one or two spots over there in the middle of Las Vegas, but as we get closer to, to uh, March 4th, we can see the exact time when these things were seen by the phone. And that's one of the really neat things is that we've, we've taken this data, and and I did this with a, a dump of like 351 uh, different records and I went ahead and made that KML I let it run for it does take a little while to run did we mention it was free I think we did um it takes a little while to run uh, but I let it run and I got this KML with 351 points and it was amazing to be able to use this slider to see okay of these points where were this where was this device at this time and that time and you can kind of track it by the cell phones Again, now Jeff mentioned these are cell towers that the device is hearing. This doesn't necessarily mean that the device is physically at each one of the pink points. It just means that that phone, that cell tower was was heard at those locations. Jeff, next slide. So here we are. We were at the end of this uh, venture that we've gone into here and and what we've really done is we, we've showed you my, my hard way of doing it, which is my way. I do everything the hard way. Uh, but but <laughs> so we, we did it the hard way. So we did it basics by by going to these websites, by entering the data in yourself and by creating the, the KML yourself. Well, having somebody else create the KML and practicing really bad OPSEC, you know, like I do. But uh, but uh, you, you we, we, do, we do these things and then we get these results. And then we also press the easy button, courtesy of Micah and Matt. And uh, we've been able to automate this process in case we've got a lot of data points to deal with um, or we just don't have a lot of time. Um, so 
now what we've done is we've taken just raw data that we found on the phone and inside of a database that at first it didn't mean anything to me. It didn't even mean anything to anybody that I worked with. And then it went from meaning nothing to anybody to helping uh, on several cases uh, place a device in an area where we otherwise may not have been able to place that device and then bolster uh, cases for detectives and, and uh, prosecutors. Now, Jeff, one of the other things I always like to mention during the webcast is you did mention a couple of places where a person would need to create an account on a website like the cell ID, um, open cell ID. You need to create an account in order to download that 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 CSV. Um, but that account is a free account that you get just by giving them an email address. And then there's another one, uh, the wiggle.net site for that Wi-Fi. You, creating a free account, you don't have to do that, but you really should. That That's the way that you get access to the cool filter search page that, that Jeff showed you earlier. Without that, you, you don't have access to search. You're just browsing data. But again, that's a free account. And the script that Matt made, the script that I made, everything in here is 100% free for you to use and try out. Absolutely, and then, and one thing I also didn't mention was Wiggle.net is also worldwide, just like Cell ID Finder. Um, uh, if you look at a map and set, if you're like me and you're nerd and you like to look at uh, Wi-Fi signals all over the world, uh, feel free to go to the website and you can see uh, there's Wi-Fi signals everywhere, China, Japan, uh, every uh, every country you can possibly think of, um, you, you have data that's there and it's ready to be exploited anytime you really want it. <laughs> Oh, good job. Nice way to put that. Yeah. Cool. Why don't you take us to the next slide? How'd you get so smart? How did you how did you learn this stuff? <laughs> smart is a, is a relative relative term, Micah. So, you know, the way I did this was, uh, and the, the first way I did it was was a hard way. I I, I did it on my own, and and I I I, I kind of you know uh, labored and toiled and took a lot of time up. But then I took uh, SCC uh, SANS, uh, SANS course at SCC 47. Um, that's where I've gotten a lot of, of, of my uh, OSINT uh, data from. Um, and then from there, it's just it's just a constant uh, uphill battle for me, you know, just constantly learning all this uh, these amazing uh, OSINT tools that are constantly changing. Micah's site, or not Micah's site, the, the, the OSINT Curious uh, site is a, is a great, uh, resource the osentframework.com. That's what I use practically. You know, every other day I'm on there. Um, just all kinds of different OS OSINT uh, uh, resources to uh, use in your daily in investigations. Um, and then if you get on Twitter, uh, you follow Micah, you follow uh, Kirby Kerbster, uh, Dutch OSINT guy. Uh, I didn't put down sector sector O three five. Is that correct, Micah? Right, sector O three five. Mm-hmm. Yep, Sector 035, you follow those people and they will give you more OSINT information than you can possibly handle probably. Um, and it's just a, it's, it's just a, a, a constant uh, learning process. And, and I, I'm not familiar with uh, Kirby's website, theplesis.net. The um, Micah, maybe you know a little bit more about that, but the netbootcamp.org uh, also provides really good OSINT tools and, and they do provide some training as well. Yeah, in, in fact, I mean, I love the the websites that you've chosen here. Plesis.net, uh, Kirby Plesis is a super amazing OSINT person. And she just, uh, for those of you that are more into social media, kind of one of the things that we call Sockment or social media intelligence, um, she just released a blog post on the new things you could do on Facebook uh, with Facebook queries and stuff. Um, and then, you know, OSINT Framework is a good resource. But again, the OSINT Curious resource down there at the very bottom, uh, we have got webcasts and podcasts. We've got these 10 minute uh, videos where if it's 10 minutes, you learn a discrete OSINT skill for free. We've also got blog posts on Instagram. Everything that we did here, uh, we talk about in our blog as well. Um, so uh, lots of cool resources out there for people. Uh, why don't you hit the next slide, Jeff? So just really quickly about SEC 487, for those of you that are interested, 
Uh, it is an entry level class. It's a 400 level class, which for us in the United States, that's kind of the, the entry level for people that are looking to get into a field. It's also a place that we had to start because, well, you can't start with the first OSINT class being a super uber advanced class. We have a, a lot of things that we cover, everything from dark web and people searching to things like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to IPs and domains. There's a whole bunch of different things that we cover there. It's a six-day class, and I'm actually flying over there to Singapore and Sydney this fall for two classes, and the dates are up there on the screen. Now, with that said, we will open up for some questions. And Ruby, I think we've we've gone ahead and, and answered, I've gone ahead and answered some of these questions in the chat, but I, oh, uh, I see that Thomas has asked, um, has, is there a certification for SEC 47? There is not yet. Uh, the course is still pretty new. Um, next month will be our one year anniversary of going public. And so what we are looking to do is uh, hopefully get a certification in 2020 next year. Um, one of the other things that somebody asked, could KML data be manipulated? Well, KML data is is in that local file on your system. So it, yeah, you can manipulate it all you want. It's just a text file and you can edit it to be whatever you want. And I'm going to jump in there, Micah. So Amen. from a digital forensic standpoint, we are worried about people manipulating uh, data. So, uh, you know, what I would, you know, what I do is, is when I send data out, um, let's say I send a report out, I, I would take an, an MD5 or a SHA-1 hash of the data and then, well, if it is changed and, and, the, and the MD5, the SHA-1 uh, hashes don't match, then we know that some data along the line has, has been changed. And so that's a, that's a real thing to, to be concerned about, it, that somebody might go in and, and try to change the KML file. Absolutely. Cool. Um, we got a couple more. We have a couple more minutes here. Uh, uh, Amit asked about ICS data and Shodan. I'm going to go ahead and defer that. That's outside the scope of this this uh, this webcast. Um, but uh, uh, that is something that that you can take a look at and get deeper into Shodan. Um, any other questions for us? Is SEC 47 a continuation of SEC 567? That is not the case. SEC 567 is social um, social engineering, of which open source intelligence or reconnaissance is part of. But no, not at all. It is uh, SEC 567 it was a two-day class that was um, just about finding and exploiting weaknesses with humans and people. And one of the things that uh, and in OSINT, one of the things that we focus on in the class is how to gather large amounts of data, how to analyze it, and then do something useful with it. That useful thing might be social engineering, but it might not be. All right. Um, what do you mean the data is volatile? I'm going to give that to you, Jeff. Well, I mean, anytime you're pulling anything off the internet, uh, you know, we can go and pull this. Uh, let's say we we do this right now, and uh, we pull the database off of of uh, Cell ID Finder, and uh, we we run everything. Um, if when we document it now, uh, that's how things are right now. Now, can these cell ID can these cell towers move? Yeah, they could move. Uh, could the the databases change? Yeah, they could change, but we're documenting things exactly how they are right now. So, um, but just, you know, beyond the cell towers, you have, you know, you have social media. Uh, the big thing we're doing right now is that we're helping investigators capture social media on pages that, that you see them. They, they come to us and go, look, I, I see this guy, he's got a video and he's doing this thing and, and I want to be able to capture this. And then the way they're going to do it is uh, they might capture the, the video by like taking a screenshot or something like that. But there's other ways of, forensically, what I would consider more a forensic method of, of collecting this data, and, 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 and Micah teaches in this class, and, and uh, there's other techniques that we, we, we talk about in the class that uh, you can pull the data off in a forensic manner and show that, yeah, the, the question before, can you manipulate KML file? Yes. Can you manipulate video? Yes. Uh, how can we show that uh, this was untouched by us and 
that the t- at the time that we saw it with our own two eyes, this is how it was when we saw it. Cool. All right, so uh, Jeff, another one for you. Any free tools other than Celebrate that can extract the information from mobile devices? So we primarily use Celebrate. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, for free tools to to extract devices uh, information off of uh, c- cellular devices, you're not going to find a lot of free tools. Uh, this is beyond the scope of the podcast, but you could, uh, for an Android situation, not not an iPhone, uh, you could uh, make an ADB backup, which is the the Android backup. And you may not get all these databases unless the device is uh, jailbroken or rooted, uh, but you could pull a lot of other databases off and, and possibly see this data on devices. So um, ADB backup might be an option, but it's very carrier specific and you're probably not going to get a lot of databases unless you, the device has been uh, uh, rooted. Uh, one last question here from Howard Thompson. How do you capture forensic data from a mobile cloud connection? I'm not sure what he means there. Do you know, Jeff? Um, no. Yeah, yeah, I might have to get a little more specific. Okay. Well, um, thank you, everybody, for having us on. Thank you for for uh, listening to us for the last hour. And as Ruby mentioned, this is being recorded. And uh, Ruby, why don't you go ahead and close us out? Okay. Well, thank you both so much for your wonderful presentation and for bringing this content to the SANS APAC community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at Asia Pacific at SANS.org. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thanks again, guys. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. See you guys.